Everybody. Welcome to Gojo and Golick, Mike Golick Jr., Mike Golick Sr., and Claudia Bellafato holding it down at the DraftKings studio in Boston. We got a great show for everybody. As always, download, subscribe, rate, review us, leave us a five star rating, and check us out here live Monday through Friday from 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern, noon to 1 p.m. Eastern, wherever you hear VSIN on the radio. It's going to be a fun one today here. Marathon Monday in Boston right now, I'm sure, has made the climb into work pretty busy. So, Claudia, we're glad you made it here. What else do we have coming up on the show today? Yeah, to fight my way through the sea of people. It was really fun. But yes, we have an awesome show, including being joined by the one and only J.J. Redick to go over the NBA playoffs now that it's all locked in. We're going to take an audit, guys. Are these NFL takes fraudulent? And great Scott, Scotty Scheffler, dominant in his second Masters victory. Second green jacket in the last three years. And I mean, it was beautiful, especially because... He was just so stone cold the whole entire time. Didn't show much emotion. So once he finally did at the end, it was awesome. 18th multiple time Masters winner. Second time multiple winner in the first five starts. And fourth youngest golfer to win multiple green jackets. There's only been three golfers to win the Masters as a pre-tournament favorite in the last 40 years. Scotty Scheffler, Tiger Woods in 05, and Fred Couples in 1992. Of course, he gets a $3.6 million for the win, but he also becomes a dad because his wife was supposed to have a baby. We weren't sure if it was going to happen during the tournament. She held off, though. She held. She waited. I'm sure she was watching him play and said, I can't interrupt this thing. So she held on. He's about to have a baby soon. He talked about wanting to just get home during the press conference, but very exciting times for him, Gojo. Very exciting times for him, Dad. And, and I know you and I have talked about this, and obviously you've talked about this for years, players who will have a wife or a significant other who's getting ready to have a child, and will they, won't they go play in a sporting event? Will they, won't they be a part of something uh, oh, out of this feeling that they need to be there? And Scotty Scheffler had said, if my wife goes to labor, I'm leaving the course. I am going to do this. Did you believe him, Dad? Did you believe him? It's... <sighs> I mean, you got to take a guy at his word. I don't know him well enough to know, you know, if he's saying, you know, is he messing around or not. As he put it, he said, I, it looks like I'm going to be at a lot of Masters tournaments, 
but I'm only going to have my first child one time. Uh, Now, I don't know if that's something to say when he has a second child, if he's not going to care as much. I don't know. (laughs) Obviously, I'm just kidding. Um, So I I don't know, Mike. We've we've gone through this. I went through this. It it doesn't matter what level you are. It's If it's going to happen, a lot of it is the mental thought process of where is your head. Even he said, you know, at times, you know, it drifts to how is his wife doing? You know, you're going to be a father. I did that with you. You were born at the end of September during football season. And that was a discussion with me and your mother. What if on Sunday and I'm in an away game and, you know, she goes into labor? Am I going to leave the game? She had said, do not leave. Stay there and play. Uh, and I, I was like, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I don't know if you know until you can say all you want, but I don't know if you know until it actually happened. Phil Mickelson went through this years ago at one of the majors. He was winning, I believe. He had the old, this how long ago it was. He had a pager. That's how long ago it was. He uh, had here a pager. Here we go. We are four minutes into paged, the show with our first pager reference. I, I, I know, I know, but he did. He did. He had a pager, and he said if his wife, if they got paged and his wife was going into labor, he was going to leave this major. That never happened either. Like, this didn't happen, so you're happy it didn't. But you just talk about the mental fortitude. I mean, to be able to, to you know, compartmentalize, you know, what you're trying to do, because at one point, while he's the best player in the world, at one point in this tournament, on the last day, there was a four-way tie for first place. Before he, you know, cruised on the back nine with five birdies and everybody else kind of fell apart. But still, you know, this this thing got tight on the last day. So you don't know where somebody's mind is with that. Obviously, his mind was just fine. And I and 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 I get it. I'm sure as, as as we'll hear afterward, man, he he just he really just wanted to go home. And I understand that because what what a mental strain that had to be in in such a monster tournament. But knowing your significant other is about to have your first child. You could just go the tiger like route to the next level, right? Before we get to the sound, you could go the tiger route to the next level and just plan ahead ahead to make sure you're not put in this situation, right? <laughs> See, there you go. Yeah. We hear all the time <laughs> about athletes that. trying to make sure they have off-season babies instead of in-season babies. Yeah. So prior <laughs> preparation prevents poor performance. But either way, Scotty Scheffler after the Masters did weigh in on this. I feel like playing professional golf is an endlessly not satisfying career. Um, for for instance, in my head, all I can think about right now is getting home. I'm not thinking about the tournament. I'm not thinking about the green jacket. I'm trying to answer your questions. I'm trying to get home. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wish I wish I could soak this in a little bit more. Maybe I will tonight when I get home. But at the end of the day, I think that's what the human heart does. You always want more. And... Um, I think you got to fight those things and and focus on what's good Um, because, like I said, winning this golf tournament does not change my identity. My identity is secure, and I cannot cannot emphasize that enough. Dad, that is simultaneously one of the healthiest things I have heard an athlete at the top of their game ever say about their relationship with their sport. And also a really interesting one to consider for golf, Dad, because I think we're all sitting here the way we always do after we get something like this, where Scotty Scheffler's now in the middle of a tear. Scotty Scheffler, as we mentioned, becomes one of the fourth, I think the fourth youngest player to win multiple green jackets at 27 years old. Scotty Scheffler now doing things and being on lists that involve him and Tiger Woods and Jack Nicklaus and very limited other people. We're in the Scotty Scheffler era now, I think officially based on what he's done. You look at this year alone, he's won three times in 2024 and hasn't carted a single round over par yet. The guy who's considered the best ball striker in the field actually didn't have that in his bag as much this season and just turned into the best putter at the Masters, which used to be the club that betrayed him. So as we get set for that, Dad, how confident are you that this can be a Scotty Scheffler era and that maybe we can touch something that rivals what we used to get with Tiger Woods when the quote we get after the Masters sounds like that? I I mean, that's all we asked, right, as as Tiger was on the downside was who's the next Tiger? You know, Rory McIlroy was thrown out there. Others were thrown out there when they'd win a couple of tournaments. Uh, we know Rory, what, has four majors, but the last one was 10 years ago. So when he was 24, so, but we thought he had four then. Okay, is he going to make this run? 
it just goes to show, and for those that don't remember, you could Google it, just the domination of Tiger. We're, we're never going to see that again. We're, we're never going no. to see that domination again and that fear factor again of a player who just walks into a tournament and for many, 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 many weeks, months, years, it was it's Tiger or the field, and you legitimately had a tough time deciding. Dad, this stat to me kind of underscores just the difficult problem we're always going to have with getting back to something like that. Since the official world golf ranking began in 1986, only Scotty Scheffler and Tiger Woods have won more than one major while occupying the world number one golf ranking. So since 1986, only those two have done it. Tiger has done it 11 times. Like that's what we're up against here. The sheer yeah, overwhelming weight of so, repetitive accomplishment. So I, I think overall, I think we can all agree that there's probably not going to be another Tiger. Scotty is 27 now, certainly still young enough to go on an absolute tear. But it's hard to believe that anybody will do what Tiger did because the talent it seems to be spread out or, or Tiger was just so dominant over everybody else. But I think what we need to do, because this is always brought up, but now I think we can put that to the side and say, let's just enjoy what Scotty Scheffler is doing. He's been number one in the world for more than 80 weeks during you know what hasn't been a long career yet. Won eight times on the tour since February 22nd. First back-to-back -back player in the players, winner in the players. So, I mean, let's enjoy this and see where it goes. And, and why he's winning, Mike, he is just so damn consistent. It's like you're waiting for a player in another sport to make a mistake, right? It, it's all, I, I, Bill Belichick, famous, and other coaches talk about it as well. If you don't win something, other players lose it, right? You're, the other team loses it, or you can lose it. Scotty is just so damn consistent. T to green, and then the putter, which, which had betrayed him, is putting better now. And listen, he had his struggles. He what he put it in the uh, did he put it in the water on or he bogeyed eleven while uh, you know Morikawa and, and Oberg put it in the water on eleven. Uh, so I mean he's human certainly because there was a four way tie uh, for this event at, you know at a point during the, the day yesterday. But he's just so consistent while he plays consistent T to green T to green. You know gets it for a short putt to finish. Not a lot of meat on the bone as they say. The other golfers start struggling. They hit it long. They hit it in the water. You know, they're scrambling just for par, you know, and, and, and it makes it difficult. So they're the ones that kind of fold, and Scotty doesn't. I mean, he just doesn't. So I, I love enjoying this because of his consistency, and just it's got to be so frustrating to the other players when he's leading, and you know – you have to play great, but he has to come back to you as well. And as, as I keep mentioning, it did for a bit with the tie, but eventually he's got to come back with you when he gets the lead, and he doesn't. He just doesn't. He stays out in front and makes you have to gain on him. So does that make you do things that you wouldn't normally do because he has a lead? We talked about that with Tiger all the time, is you end up trying things maybe you wouldn't try because you're trying to catch Tiger in this. I, it's pretty wild, too. You know how the last year's winner puts on the green jacket for this year's winner? Remember, he won this two years ago. So last yeah. year, he put the jacket on John Rahm uh, and when Rahm won it. Now, this year, Rahm put it back on him. You know, these two are probably saying, hey, let's just keep going back and forth on this as they trade putting on the green jacket. And I remember going back to fl Friday, Claudia talked about the odds of the big three versus the field. And in all honesty, it was the big one. Right, because it yeah. was it was Scotty, it was John Rom, and it was Rory. Rory finished four over. Rom finished nine over. To which the only good thing you can say is, well, I was better than Tiger. You know, as we'll we'll get to what Tiger did. Uh, but it's really Scotty. You know, you wonder in the next one is Scotty alone against the field because those other two never really were in this thing. No, the way he's playing right now, it's certainly going to be Scotty versus the field. And I think that part of what you mentioned is the difficult sell in this is Scotty Scheffler's game. The appeal is the overwhelming consistently. You ask any player in any sport known to man, one of the most frustrating opponents that you can play against is not the guy that's got these massive highs or where you've got to worry about the haymakers. It's the guy that can actually show up and be the same dude over and over again every play for the entirety of a game because most of the rest of us can't. We saw a leaderboard that was packed with people all bunched at the top going into the final day. And 
And then one by one, from Max Homa to the rest of this group, we just saw them sort of fall away. Colin Marikawa, that whole group found a way to make mistakes down the stretch. And there's a lot of good sells in that, right? Bryson DeChambeau, who's near the top of the leaderboard for most of the week, has always been an interesting character in golf, from the tinkering nerd to the behemoth at the tee, now part of the live contingency here. Max Homa's been the internet's favorite golfer and is now turning into a really great golfer over this recent stretch. And then Scotty Scheffler's this dude that just kind of feels like the bland white guy that everybody knows that works in their office that doesn't have a ton of yep. distinguishing characteristics. And so you've got that all one side, dad, all with the backdrop of Tiger Woods. And Claudia, we should mention Tiger Woods because this weekend, even if there wasn't the top end production that we've been used to with Tiger Woods, this does constitute a major accomplishment as this was the first 72 hole round at a, re- a legitimate tournament that Tiger had finished since February of last year. It was, which is an accomplishment and his 24th consecutive time making the cut. However, we have to mention it was his worst career finish ever. Despite winning the green jacket five times, he went 16 over. And this one, you just talked about it being the 72 hole. The last time he's done that among 60 golfers who made the 36 hole cut. So a lot of bad things mixed in with good. But at the end of the day, he said he was proud of his performance and it was a good weekend overall. And remember at first, guys, DraftKings had him at minus 150 to miss the cut. And I talked about how that got slammed the other way because everyone's like, hold on, wait a minute. You're going to give me Tiger Woods to make it at plus money? And then he did so, like I said, 24th consecutive time. So I can see why he said it's successful. Curious Senior, as you watch this and you watch Tiger, what emotions did you feel? We've seen him be so successful at the top for so long. What was it like seeing him sort of fall to the bottom of the leaderboard? Well, you asked us that on Thursday to cash or trash him making the cut, and I trashed it. I said, you know, my heart wants him to make the cut, but if I was going to put some money on it, I was, I, 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 I did, I did. But you know what? I'm happy he made it. Yeah, I I wanted him to make it. I just didn't think he was going to. Shot a 73 and 72 was what one over. The cut line was six over. I mean, there were guys playing that actually said when they were five and six over, finishing their second round. You know, they were they finished their second round. They were basically packing up their lockers to leave until they found out what the cut line was. So Tiger made it easily. So now everybody's looking forward uh, to Saturday. And Saturday was just abysmal. Shoots an 82 on Saturday, a 77 yesterday. But that Saturday round, around Mike, even the announcers were saying they thought after nine holes he was going to pull himself out because you, you saw him bend down to tee the ball. You saw him bend down to pick up the ball, and it looked like his back was really, really messing with him. And again, pick a spot, foot, knee, you know, back. What, what, what's it going to be? Uh, with him of what's going to to ache but you know overall he said it was a good week and I think mainly because he finished the week and he plans on playing and all the other majors as well Um, so we'll see but listen even Saturday when he's playing bad you're watching every single shot you're watching every shot Tiger hits because it's Tiger Woods and there's that hope amongst hope that he's going to somehow get himself in it but at times on Saturday I'm like watching you just were kind of crossing your fingers when he took a shot and praying it wasn't sprayed somewhere over the golf course. Uh, Saturday and Sunday was like that. It was incredibly anxiety driven. It was like, it was the anxiety I remember feeling when Alex Smith got back on the field for the first time and he was playing against Aaron Donald and you're just waiting for the worst possible thing to happen because you know the backdrop of that other player. And for Tiger Woods, it was, it was, it was Rocky. It was throwing the towel. It was throwing the damn towel. But for a guy that just became the 21st player ever to have his hundredth masters appearance, I'm sure this meant something to Tiger. And I'm sure for a guy that's been battling back against all this injury, I'm sure just finishing felt like an accomplishment in its own right once you kind of level set. Because I'm sure even Tiger, in a moment, would probably tell you coming off Thursday and Friday, feeling the way he did, maybe you feel like, okay, I I can make a run, I can recapture some of this magic. But I I thought once he had to get 23 holes in on Friday, Dad, that was going to be what damned him. If it wasn't already a tough uphill battle against his body and against time, having to jam all that in because of the way play got delayed to start Thursday, I I think really sealed the fate there. And it kind of gave way to a cool moment like because when you got to Sunday and Tiger was out of it and the wheels were really falling off here the other story that took over from the weekend was Neil Shipley the low amateur that was playing with Tiger Woods the grad student out of Ohio State this big long haired dude who was bombing drives off the tee and 
I, you, Dan, I don't know if you saw this. The whole time, it was hilarious because you looked like Tiger Woods is miserable. He's sweating through one of his new Tiger logo yep. shirts that yep. look conspicuously <clears throat> yeah. like an Arkansas Razorback shirt with that logo in the middle, by the way. But story for another day. And Tiger's miserable. He's going through a round where the wheels have fully fallen off. And you just see Shipley kind of waiting. I'm sure like every 23-year-old would when face-to-face with yeah. the icon of their sport and like finally waits to make that comment and gets the smile out of Tiger Woods and all the sudden you see them going back and forth and uh, we don't know what was said yet at this point but the kind of stuff that i'm sure lasts a lifetime for a dude like chipley in a round that's going to be a throwaway for tiger woods was really cool to say yeah i think once the ice was broken there because you knew tiger was miserable i'm sure shipley was like how do i how do i approach this but tiger was great yep. it seemed ask asked answered all his questions he does need to get better wicking in his shirts that's for sure with all the sweat that was there but it was cool Quick note, Shipley's caddy was his 20-year-old buddy who golfed in high school, yeah. and, and all of a sudden this 20-year-old is out caddying the Masters, and he gets to meet Tiger Woods. I mean, it was really pretty pretty wild thing. So that was a great story. And then you got to quickly mention Ludwig Oberg, right? The kid who finished second, runner-up to the Masters in his first major. His first major, 24-year-old from Texas Tech, Ends up at one point on nine, I think, one stroke behind Scotty Scheffler in the dude's first major. He was fun to watch. He was always smiling. He was taken in the moment. And, oh, by the way, in his first major, he took home a check for $2.16 million for 24 years old. Good on him. Good work if you can get it. There's no doubt. Uh, yeah, he was yeah. Uh, one of the one of the incredible stories that we thought on the final day was going to make this one of the most crowded and exciting Masters Sundays that we had gotten in a while. And instead, the overwhelming might and consistency of Scotty Scheffler reigns supreme. Congratulations to Scotty Scheffler, your 2024 Masters champion. Looking at more Scotty style burgers coming at next year's dinner.
Welcome back to Gojo and Golik. Uh, coming up here in about 10 minutes, going to take a look at the now set NBA playoff field. We finished up the final weekend of the regular season. And man, if you thought the final Sunday at the Masters was a crowded field, the top of the Western Conference really and the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> all separated by about a game. You had the top all tied for the one seed that we had to sort out going into the final day. I will tell you the most important figure that helped sort out the top of the NBA's Western Conference, and he played for not a single one of the teams that was actually in contention <laughs> for that. J.J. Redick will also join us to help preview some of the NBA playoffs, and I want to find out if a guy like J.J. Redick's learned anything. He's doing a podcast with LeBron James now, and J.J. Redick is such a smart, diligent student of basketball, Dad. You know this. J.J. Redick was a very good player, but wasn't the best player. Certainly wasn't the most talented player, especially right. when he got to the NBA, and so you've got to be about the work, and that's always been J.J.'s story is it's been about the work so you tend to and you were dead like this as a player that was a you know a former 10th round draft pick that goes on and becomes a starter in the NFL it's got to be about everything else from the neck up and LeBron James is just that rare exception where you combine both I'd be curious if JJ Redick himself has learned anything in talking with LeBron James since they started doing the mind the game podcast I think the first thing I would ask uh is hey LeBron can we do the pot at your house and, you know <laughs> go to his house, be in his house. But JJ Reddick's house right, is God. probably That's nice, but they're they're probably in a little bit. I, I'm sure it is. I, I, I'm, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it's beautiful. I'm no doubt. But hey, let's go do it in a wing of LeBron's house. <laughs> yeah. One of one of those. So we'll see. It seems like they do it in like a warehouse every time. It's very strange setting, but uh, yeah. you know. Uh, uh, it's a very well done podcast. I'm excited to talk to him about him about that and about the NBA playoffs here. But before we get to any of that, full yeah. stop over what went on this weekend here. I'm sitting around watching an incredible Masters run over the weekend. I'm diving into the most important app in sports in the Masters app, We're watching everything else goes on. Notre Dame lacrosse is one. I'm having a great time. And then all of a sudden, I look up at our friends over on Sweat. You were a meme at one point. Lots of you guys check Someone out mentioned Sweat this. here on the weekend. All these things. And I look up, and I am floored because our good friend Claudia is on with the guys this weekend. And they're going back over a viral meme from a year that I can't place right now that I remember very vividly, clowning on like everybody else on the internet. I had no idea that our friend Claudia was the subject of this meme. And so now we've got to do, I think it was Tosh.0 Tosh who did the web redemptions here. I need to go back and check this out. This is the clip from The Sweat this weekend where we found out Claudia was first team all meme team. You were a meme at um, one point. Someone mentioned this yesterday. So I was yesterday years old when I found this out. This is one of same. the most popular memes in recent memory. What was he saying to you? I've actually never told anybody what he actually said. Oh my said. god! This is breaking oh my god. This is big J journalism! But it's not very interesting. I had met this kid once before. Oh yeah? And in my ear, he's basically saying, I really think my mom would love you. I make a ton of money because ah. I work in finances, blah, blah, blah. And I'm so bad at holding my emotions in that I am just like, Run. Look at your face. <laughs> and then come to find out he had a girlfriend and the girlfriend oh, found this video. Oh, no. Whoa. Are <laughs> so you kidding me? The whole thing was like in the field. And I had like all of my guy friends text me and be like, can you please tell my girlfriend that's not me? And I'm like, no, I'm no going to let dude. everybody sweat this one out. Oh, that's oh incredible. What's his name so we can bully him? No, I can't. What if he's a fan of the show? Oh, he definitely is. Everyone's a fan of this show. That's true. Jake, you're still a great guy. Okay, oh, Jake. It's Jake. Oh, not the, not the <laughs> government name. No. Okay. So for anyone that wasn't watching on DKN, if you if you don't usually, today would be the day. Claudia is one in a long line of memes where. Uh, a, a young man appears to be either mansplaining or saying something not pleasing to a young lady whose face betrays the feelings inside. Claudia, in this case, was that young woman in a crowded bar listening to a big old white boy tell her things she didn't want to hear at that time. So, Claudia, what was it like when this was going viral for you? I woke up in an absolute panic because I was a senior in college looking to get like my first TV job, right? And all of a sudden I have 7,000 notifications. My heart dropped. What happened? What did I do? My friends are like, you're viral. I said, please tell me it's for something good. And I didn't know if this was gonna be good or not. 
And I don't really think it technically was, but it's funny because a lot of the people in the industry I know now was through seeing it. Like Scott Hansen saw it and he reached out and Matthew Berry, who I'm friends with now, <laughs> reached out about it. He's like, is this actually you? I said, yeah. And a lot of Syracuse people, which those guys are, saw it. It was at a Syracuse bar. It was ridiculous. But the craziest part of it all is we were in college. So he's saying, I have all this money. I'll take care of you. First of all, buddy, I met you once. Second of all, we're in college, so you don't have money. And third of all, you play club lacrosse. No disrespect to lacrosse, but like he was acting like he had millions of dollars and he was going to marry me and whatever. And so the guys asked me uh, if I remembered his last name. I went to my phone to look and I, I saved his contact as Jake Meme. So, Jake, I'm so sorry if you're watching this. I just so, forget uh, your last name. Can, I was, I was I, really worried I have a, when we I have pulled a this up that we were going to end up doxing Jake Meme. So I'm glad we blurred <laughs> the appropriate parts of this to protect his identity. Yeah. <laughs> Dad. So I, I have a couple questions, Claudia. Okay. Um, you said this was in a bar in, yeah. in Syracuse. Was this a planned date or were you just at a bar and he came up to you what what's a little bit of the background here oh yeah sororities have dances they're not dances but it's basically parties where you dress up you bring someone i met him one seemed like a cool dude so i invited him massive regret because it was just not it just wasn't it but yeah so technically i did invite okay him. so, so no i i yeah, I just wanted to know. So, so you were there together. It wasn't like you were hanging out there and he tried to pick you up. So Correct. you went there together. And then basically you went there together. You had met him once. Now you're on this date, so-called date. Yeah. And then that's what he's whispering in his ear. He's mm -hmm. trying to sell himself. It's like, he, it's like he threw out everything right in the beginning, right? My mom's going to love you and I have a lot of money. I mean, that's, that's throwing it all out right there, right? I mean, that's, that's leading with everything. That's like throwing the best haymaker you have in the ring, mm -hmm. right? And someone and hitting him square in the face. And basically, you barely flinched and said, all right, enough of that. Oh, no, I flinched, senior. It just rudely with my face. Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. just going to say. it's. I, but the other part oh. of this that got mentioned was that apparently this guy had, I mean, it sounds like this guy was not being forthright in his situation with you. Yeah. Because after the fact, he's like, dude, can you please help? My girlfriend's freaking out. I was like, First of all, buddy, if you have a girlfriend, why were you coming to my formal? So I don't feel bad at all. So he, no, he messed up. So also, oh, what, when, when that date ended at the end of the night, was, was that it? Did, did you leave that date saying, I will never be going out with this guy again? Or never. was there the thought of another date? Never, ever spoke to him again. Ever. That was a bar that I worked at, too. So the bartenders asked me after. I didn't even know they took the video. Everyone's like, that's planned. I was like, no, it wasn't. But they showed me after the fact, and they were like, who is that dude? I'm like, I don't know. I'll never see him again. <laughs> I never thought I would even it, see that ah. night again, but I've seen it millions and millions of times over. This was five, six years ago now, so... Ridiculous. It's just so funny to me in the internet era to think about all the times that we've seen like guys out at a sporting event with like a woman they're not supposed to be there with get caught up on TV or the <laughs> jumbotron. This guy got caught up via internet meme, which has to be one of the dumbest ways to go down. Well, that was the best part too. When people were making memes, they would be like uh, a guy explaining the Masters to a girl or explaining the NFL playoffs, and a bunch of people found me and they're like, "No, actually, she works in sports, so that's definitely not it." <laughs> Nope, keep guessing. <laughs> but now it's out there. But, or or wow. it's definitely why the eye roll was as vicious as it was because, buddy, coming over here trying to mansplain sports to anyone sucks, but let alone to an aspiring sports broadcaster at that point. Dad, not the smartest move in the bag. No, no, and you wonder what the fallout was for one Jake uh, who made this move uh, while he was uh, – uh, dating somebody else. Uh, yeah. Not a good ending for him at all and a meme for you. So all's well that ends well. Sorry, maybe, Jake meme. Maybe not. Look at... No. <laughs> <laughs> better luck next time, meme Jake. I can't say we're rooting for you, but better luck next time.
Golick with the craziness that was the last day of the regular season in the NBA. We're going to take a look at the Western Conference first because OKC locked in that top seed in the West. They entered the final day in three-way tie for first place with the Nuggets and Mi Minnesota Timberwolves, but of course they came out on top, making them the youngest team in history. Guys, the average age under 24. So coming up in the play-in, we have New Orleans versus the Lakers. We have the Kings and Golden State. That's on Tuesday. And then OKC, of course, playing one of the losers. Denver, one of the losers for the one and two seed Sunday, Saturday. And then Saturday, we get Minnesota, Phoenix, Clippers, and Dallas. I have to say, I really do love all of these matchups. And then I look to the odds at the DraftKings Sportsbook in the West. And that's where I question these numbers. Because the Nuggets are the favorite at plus 125, I get. But then you have the Clippers at 6-1, to one, and then the Thunder, who just got the one seed at 7-1. to one. Gojo, am I being dramatic and saying this feels a little bit disrespectful? Um, you know what? Based on everything we know about the NBA playoffs, Dad, and the propensity for young teams to struggle because of all the differences that we hear about this time of year, to have the youngest one seed ever in a field that was so crowded that we had three teams legitimately and then the Nuggets and the Timberwolves competing for that spot, I don't think it's that far-fetched. Now, the Clippers being the one to also still draw this, where we're hanging on the thread of, hey, what all these players can be when healthy and when they're together in the right machinations in ways that seem increasingly less likely as the season went along here and concern us with the Clippers of it all, that part might be a little wild. The Nuggets certainly being where they are, no one's surprised by that. The Clippers being the team to be the one, that is a little bit surprising, but we know how potent that lineup is when they're all healthy and on the court at the same time. I was surprised. I look forward to what J.J. Redick has to say about this and his thoughts because I was surprised as well because we still need to see what Minnesota is going to be with Carl Anthony Towns coming back, right? Just like we're seeing what the 76ers are when we talk about the East later uh, since Embiid came back, winning eight in a row, and they're still in the play-in, but, the, but what they are and how formidable they are right now. But here in the West, I mean, kudos Oklahoma City. I thought Denver, once Cat got hurt, I thought Oklahoma City being a young team, I thought Denver would eventually be that number one seed. Kudos Oklahoma City for, for taking that. Obviously led by uh, SGA, and you got a guy who may be the, uh, the most improved player of the year in uh, Jalen Williams on that team, though we'll see who Tyrese Maxey may get that as well for the 76ers. But you got some talent you know, young kid in, in, with Chet Holmgren and what he's doing, vying for Rookie of the Year, though I think Wemby's going to get that. But what a fun team they are to watch a young team in this. I still heavily favor the, the Denver Nuggets, and I'm really looking forward to the play-in games. Uh, that's what we get first of New Orleans and the Lakers. Lakers just beat New Orleans uh, yesterday. And then the winner is the seventh seed. Loser takes on the winner of Sacramento and Golden State for the eighth seed. So because we're, we're all wondering, can the Lakers and or Golden State make any noise coming out of the play-in if, the, if they're in there? And I want to talk about that in a second, but I teased this before, and I want to make sure we all pay the respect to the person that actually decided the one seed in the Western Conference. Because credit to Oklahoma City for doing everything that they did, but we want to talk about the youth movement here. This only happened because of Victor Wembanyama, the butterfly effect of Friday's right. game against the Denver Nuggets, where Denver was in control of the one seed. If Denver just takes care of business against the Grizzlies and against the San Antonio Spurs team, they are the one seed in the Western Conference. They are up by 23 points in this game, and then Victor Wembanyama goes on an unholy tear where he scores 17 points in about three minutes' time including bombing shots from beyond the arc that dad are the stamp on what is surely the rookie of the year season yeah. by leaps and bounds yeah. and might be giving way to a conversation about much more than that much sooner than even all, any of us could have expected in our wildest dreams for this guy. So the Victor Wembenyama butterfly effect of now the Lakers potentially having to face the Denver Nuggets in the first round of the playoff if they make it out of the play-in tournament as opposed to one of these younger teams that we thought maybe they'd be able to pick off. I don't think think can be overstated in how much Victor Wembanyama has already affected this NBA postseason and the dude's not even going to be playing in it. Yeah, I mean, the position Denver was in 
to just take care of business because they went into Sunday needing a win and needing both Minnesota and Oklahoma City to lose for them to be the one seed. Minnesota did lose, but Oklahoma City did not. Uh, so that's why they're the number one seed. And you're right now, Denver sitting at the two slot. So actually the winner of New Orleans and the Lakers gets Denver. So that we know. The winner of that game is the seventh seed, and they're going to get the two seed, and that's Denver. And if it's the Lakers, we saw what happened last year when they took on Denver. And will it, would it be any different this year? I, I don't listen. I don't know if it would for any team. I still say Denver coming out of the West anyway. I would agree if you're the Lakers and you're trying to be optimistic. You've won eight of your last 11. Your last stanza of this was a LeBron right. James triple-double. It was Anthony Davis looking particularly dominant on the block, which is what you're going to need if you were going to challenge a team like the Denver Nuggets. And so there is plenty of interesting. The West is a juggernaut. It is chock full of talent. It is the side of the map that we are all really looking forward to, where in the middle you've got teams like the Clippers that we talked about, teams like the Dallas Mavericks who have been incredible down the home stretch of the season since the trade deadline the way we talked about with Zach Harper last week so there's plenty to get into there Claudia the Eastern Conference feels a little bit different with basically the Celtics and the field right now and the Celtics looking like they should be the overwhelming favorite with a couple of surprises mixed in here yeah, and we know now that number two seed does go to the Knicks. They got a 120-119 overtime win. So that was a sweat against the Bulls. Philly ended up in the play-in, which, similar to that Clippers squad, it seems like we have the same conversation. Well, if they're all healthy, then yeah, they can do damage. So they're going to be facing Miami on Wednesday, Chicago, Atlanta for the other play-in Wednesday. Then you have Boston and New York, of course, that one and two. Milwaukee against Indiana and Cleveland and Orlando Senior, how surprised do you expect to be by the results of these games? Like Gojo said, lots of question marks outside of Boston. Uh, listen, I, I look at Philadelphia right now. You had the, the two biggest winning streaks before we get to Philly were the Knicks who won their last five and got in with that overtime win. One of the very few close games yesterday, a lot of them were ridiculous blowouts where the ends of, ends of the benches were getting emptied. Uh, they've won five in a row, and Oklahoma City has won five in a row to help get them the number one seed. But the 76ers have won eight. They're on an eight-game winning streak. Remember, they were third before Embiid got hurt, and then they dropped, I think, to as low as eight. Now they're sitting at seven slot. And let me tell you what, the t Boston Celtics, the teams at the top, got to fear them the most. But, but first, it'll be the Knicks, right? Because the winner of the 76ers in heat, that's going to be the seven seed, so that's going to be the Knicks. So the Knicks made a nice run to get to number two, and your prize may be a healthy 76ers team who I think will beat Miami and be the seven seed. And all of a sudden, Mike, that's the team I'm going to I've, – I've somewhat given up, and again, I'm interested to hear J.J. Redick – with Milwaukee. They have fallen by the wayside. Yeah. They're playing. They're, they're locked in uh, against uh, the, uh, the the Pacers, and they were 1-4 and four against the Pacers this year. Every game was before Doc got there, but Doc's record has not been good since he got to Milwaukee. You got Giannis coming off the, the, uh, the uh, calf strain, so I'm, I'm about done with them. So it looks like, is it going to be the Knicks that can battle there? But you ask me right now, uh, who's going to battle the Celtics? I think it's going to be the 76ers. Yeah, I think that's going to be the sexy pick for a lot of people looking at the names that they trust going into this postseason, where again, you've got the Bucks that were on a bit of a slide here. A Cavaliers team that may have sneaky kind of tanked the end of their game against yeah. the Hornets to get the four seed yeah. instead of the three seed. So you get the matchup with the Magic team that's young and led by Powell Bancaro and all that stuff. So a little bit of gamesmanship. And I think the biggest wild card of it all, Dad, this Knicks team that has been so decimated by injury but has persevered to this point. Can Jalen Brunson, who has played at times MVP caliber basketball during this season, drag basketball mecca into meaningful games into the postseason again as now the Knicks seem to have become legitimate, competent adults in the NBA space against all odds considering everything that we know about ownership there. Yep. That's, uh, that's going to be a fun team to watch. And really quickly on Cleveland, you mentioned, Cleveland was beating Charlotte by eight going into the fourth quarter and then sat all their starters and played the end of the bench and got outscored 32-14 to 14th in the fourth to the secure that fourth slot and not go to the third slot to take on the Pacers. <laughs> A collective sigh of relief from the internet. Finally, people yeah. <laughs> looking at these situations feel like the front offices and teams acted the way they would.
Hoping to talk to J.J. Redick, our teammate around here at DraftKings. Obviously, you see him calling games on ESPN, the Old Man and the Three podcast. Now, mind the game with him and LeBron James also adding to the media empire built by J.J. Redick. But before we get into J.J. Dad, I wanted to ask you a question that our producer Slates brought up earlier this morning. The NBA's play-in tournament, we've had it for a few years now. We've seen a lot of good that's come out of this, I think, in terms of not only the entertainment value that you get on the way in to the NBA playoffs, but also down the stretch of the season, there's been some compelling nature to this about who gets to avoid having to get into this, even the seeding in it that the Lakers were the example of this year, moving from that nine slot to the eight slot and avoiding having to win two games to make it into the postseason as opposed to just the one. Do you think this year's results kind of help or hurt the argument and the continued existence of the NBA's play-in tournament that Adam Silver wanted to institute. Oh, I love it. I, I I love it. You know, you get down to the you play 82 games, then you get down to the end of the season, and it can come down to the one at least for the nine and ten uh, to get themselves in it. It just adds a little more drama, right? I mean, if you didn't have this, you'd have you'd have had no race in the East, right? You go to your eight seed Miami. Uh, they're seven games clear of the nine seed Bulls, so you you had zero drama there. It would, ju- would have just been amongst the seeding. It had a little more drama in the West as far as trying to get to that A slot. I like it, uh, so I I'm a fan of it. I think it's very cool. The the only thing maybe you look at is if you're the first and second seed, you should almost know who your opponent's going to be, and now you don't. You got to kind of wait. Uh, to prepare, not like these guys aren't prepared. It's going to be one of a few teams. Whereas, you know, teams like, you know, you know, three through six all know who they're going to play and prepare for. That seems to be the kind of the only kind of different thing. But I don't know how, how big of a factor that really is. So for me, I like the drama of the playing. Absolutely. Well, I think it's only a factor in specific situations. And certainly on the West side, you have it being a factor because you have a chance to face two of the faces of a generation potentially in LeBron James or Steph Curry coming out of there. And that's no disrespect to what the Pelicans have done since Zion went into point forward mode at the end of the season or the Sacramento Kings and lighting the beam from last year's holdover. Like, we know what people would actually be afraid of in the postseason. So I think some of it's matchup dependent that because most often you'd associate those play-in games with what we're seeing in the Eastern Conference. Like the 9-10 Bulls and Hawks matchup, that might be a tree falling in the woods kind of moment because those are two bad basketball yeah, teams. Yeah. The most interesting thing about the Hawks is which of the guys in their backcourt are they going right. to trade or move this offseason. So the East kind of failed to meet the criteria of creating interest with the teams at the end of the bench there because this is really about, hey, can the 76ers or Heat muster up enough postseason boogeyman to them to make this thing interesting? Here's where what would really bum the league out, I think, a lot of people, unless you're a Pelican uh, and King fan. Can you imagine in the first play-in in the West, New Orleans beats the Lakers, so New Orleans the seven. Sacramento beats Golden State, so then Sacramento and the Lakers play, and Sacramento beats the Lakers. Golden State and the Lakers out. Not even in the playoffs to even talk about in those first round matchups with Oklahoma City and Denver. That would, you know, with the, the great names of Steph Curry and LeBron James, that would be a bummer for the NBA. But I think you'll get at least one uh, of those teams in. So we'll wait and see. So I, I do like the drama of it. And like I said, if, if I'm going to put money on a team below the six line, uh, it's going to be the Philadelphia 76ers. Yeah, I'm not going to cry too much for the NBA's TV ratings there or anything because I do think a world where Zion Williamson is in the postseason and finally seems to be putting things together yeah. is always a net positive for this league that's been praying this guy would become the star that we hoped he would be out of Duke. And that is a kind of what I think is at stake in this NBA postseason, Dad, when you look at some of the teams, some of the young players that are getting up in here. Like, Claudia, we're going to take a look at the series odds that are up on DraftKings Sportsbook in a second here, and it seems the Cleveland Cavaliers 
Cavaliers got their wish in terms of getting to a matchup that would be a little bit more favorable for them. But, Dad, when you look at this, we went through in the in-season tournament this fall, Therese Halliburton becoming a name that people started to know the first half of the season. And while maybe it hasn't kept that same level of fire in the second half of the season post-All-Star break, now we get them in the postseason for that Magic team. Now we get Paolo Bancaro in the postseason so more people can get exposed to that name. You go on and on down the list. It's what we've talked about with Oklahoma City all year. These are important moments. I always go back to that bubble run where you had guys like Donovan Mitchell that made this big star turn and announced themselves on that playoff stage in a way that makes them in the NBA where we know that's the only time of year that really matters in the way that people discuss legacy or the way people discuss the sport by and large. Having that banked in, that playoff capital is so important. So, Claudia, what do we have as far as the series odds right now as we get going for the first round of this? Well, Gojo, you said close to favorable for the Cavs. DraftKings Sportsbook is saying a little bit more than close to because they're close to minus 200 favorites over the Magic. Minus 195 for the Cavs right now to win that series. Pretty much even for the rest of them except for Bucks Pacers. Bucks minus 245. Pacers plus 195. Just four up for the odds right now. Then Suns, Timberwolves even, Clippers, Mavs even. To see the Cavs minus 195, I get the bucks, but do we feel like that's maybe too much respect now for the Cavs, Gojo? No, no, uh, no I'll, uh, I'll no, go with the Cavs there. The, what, right. what, okay. Yeah, I, I think where I, I take my money is, is the Pacers. I like the, what would you say, plus 195? 195, for the Pacers? yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean they're they're four and one against the Bucks. You got Giannis coming off the the calf strain, so that that may be a way, Mike. I would be thinking about going. I didn't know your name was Gojo all of a sudden. That was the thing that confused me and all. Sorry, I, I felt strongly about that, so I just jumped in. Old Joe jumped in here and decided to want to give his Pacers take are you, here. Are your feelings hurt? Did I hurt your feelings? I know. I just I wanted to make sure your hearing was all right. I know you're getting up there. I worry about you being able to survive the little beep test when you go to the doctor's office here. You got to raise your hand and wow. everything. So wow. I'll just say Mike next time. You guys can fight <sighs> over it. How about that? Yeah, I really see all <laughs> I'm, hell break. Mike, loose. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I cut you off. Is that what you were waiting for? An apology? Yeah, it was. That was what I was waiting for here. Okay. And to talk about these Indiana Pacers, because, Dad, I think you're absolutely right that that's a very enticing place to look for this Milwaukee team. And Now, we understand. I remember talking to Amin about this. It's always worth reminding everybody how different the gap is here in terms of scouting. Because, Dad, I think we always think of this in terms of football in our brains, where you go through and your entire week, leading up to a football game, even in the regular season, is spent with incredible levels of preparation because you've got six days in between games, because you've got all this time to pour over tape and tendencies and learn that other team front to back going into this matchup because in a sport where you've got a 17, now 18 game regular season or in a college even less than that, every game is so deathly important versus this you know 82 game field in the NBA where Every night can't be the be-all, end-all. You don't have the time to plan around it. Now we finally get to the time of year where you've got people diligently locked in on defensive game plans, actually going over multiple guys on the staff with a fine-tooth comb, how you're going to strategically attack this other team. And so it does change the nature of it. And Doc Rivers, for all his postseason misgivings, and even this year, all the failure that we've seen from that group, still a veteran coach on a team with plenty of guys that have championship experience that are now going to go in the time of the year where they get to turn this up in a way this Pacers squad just isn't used to so the weight of experience I, I, it's we're going to get to where the rubber meets the road with that this year because the Bucks have absolutely looked like a deer that's a little bit disadvantaged in the woods right now waiting to get taken out for most of the back stretch of this season yeah the Bucks trying to flip the switch in the playoffs I believe that switch isn't going to have much electricity to it I just I just don't see it I, I, I keep try, I kept trying to give them the benefit of the doubt saying when they get their guys together and can get some games together, you know, under their belt uh, with, with all the injuries, but that's never really happened. Now Giannis coming back in off of an injury, not playing since the injury. We still have, so where Embiid has come back and played for a while. So I think it's going to be very that would not shock me at all if they were to get dumped in the in the series against the Pacers. Yeah, Milwaukee has been on the ropes for a while, and we keep wondering who is going to land the knockout blow. We will see if the Indiana Pacers 
have that or if we're going to have to wait for somebody else as we finally get started with playoff basketball this week. Put the rest aside and get ready to go. But coming up next, I got to tell you about the biggest hero from this weekend in the NBA. We already talked about the Wembenyama butterfly effect. I'll do you one better with the man that managed to feed an entire arena all by himself next. Welcome back to Gojo and Golick, Mike Golick Jr., Mike Golick Sr., and Claudia Bellafato. And as we finally turn the calendar to postseason mode for the NBA, we get to get a little smarter about that as we welcome in our friend, former Duke and NBA star, and now co-host of the Old Man and the Three podcast, as well as Mind the Game with LeBron James. J.J. Redick, kind enough to join us here now. And J.J., want to get to plenty of NBA talk with you as we turn to the postseason, but my father's itching to get to something non-basketball related with you right now. I don't even know what this is, so we're all going to just take the ride with uh, Dad. What do you got going on, Dad? J.J., I'm, I'm wondering. We, we saw Scotty Scheffler win the Masters, but said he would have left if his pregnant mm. wife mm. went into labor, who lives in Texas. I had two kids born during the football season when I was playing, and and neither one conflicted, so I never had to had to miss a game. Were you ever close to that? And if so, if you were in that situation, would you have left or did you? You know, my my wife and I are planners, and so we planned <laughs> our uh, children around having them in the off season. We planned so impe impeccably; they actually both had the same due date. That's how impeccable our planning is. <laughs> <laughs> Now, they don't have the same birthday, but uh, they're they're two days apart. So it's end of August. And if I'm in Scotty's situation, ah, man, that's a tough one, especially if it's your first. That's a tough one. And that's ultimately his decision. But I don't know, as an athlete, I don't know that I'm, I'm missing the opportunity to win another green jacket. 
<laughs> yeah, that's a tough one. I know he could say, yeah, no, he's already got his first green jacket, so maybe it feels less dire to him. But, man, uh, I'm with you. That one's a hard one to turn down. And thankfully, Scotty didn't have to get put in that position. And neither did J.J. Redick, because as we've established, incredibly <laughs> diligent planner. That's a true sports guy right there. And uh, that's why we're excited to talk about it, uh, everything here with him today. So, uh, J.J., we, we finally set this here. We'll get to a, an incredibly crowded Western Conference field that had a really exciting finish to that season, deciding the one seed, deciding the play-in. But I, I want to go to one of your former teams here, because I feel like now so much of the public conversation goes going into this playoffs is going to be about the Philadelphia 76ers because of what Joel Embiid's done with this return. Are they the biggest wild card in this postseason overall? I think so. Um, you know, they've played incredible basketball uh, for the last two, three weeks to put themselves in a position to host this play in game on Wednesday night, which I will be on the call uh, with Mike Breen and Doris Burke for that. And Lisa Salter. Uh, so, that that it it felt like for a couple months there post Embiid injury and with Milwaukee's struggles and and a bunch of Knicks players getting hurt and Cleveland being super inconsistent it just felt like Boston sort of was going to walk into the NBA Finals and I still think Boston they've been the best team all year I still think they're going to ultimately win the Eastern Conference but Philly's a, certainly a wild card. Uh, I'm 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 not going to bet against Dame Lillard and Giannis in a playoff setting. And uh, how about the New York Knicks and what Jalen Brunson has done to put them in the second seed? I, I'm I'm getting ready to record my end of season awards, and I'll, I'll vote later on today as soon as I get my ballot. Uh, I'm I'm like, where do I put Jalen Brunson in the MVP? Where do I put Jalen Brunson yeah. in all NBA? He he has just elevated not only his game but a franchise in the span of like a year and a half, you know, going back to last January uh, 1st of 2023, his play. I mean, it, it is, I, I said this the other day, like you can't, he's been a top 10, I don't care what somebody's resume is. He's been a easy top 10 player in the NBA this right. season. Yeah. So what have you done for me lately? And what he's done has been top 10 player. Completely agree with that fun team to watch winning in overtime over the Bulls yesterday. Milwaukee, you mentioned them. I've been trying, JJ, all, you know, a lot of the year to say, man, when they get Middleton and Dame and Giannis all playing together consistently, this could be a team to watch, but they haven't. And now you have Giannis coming in off the calf injury. I just, I'm telling you, and, and I, I kind of lead toward the Pacers, who are 4-1 and one against the Bucks here. Do you really think Milwaukee, even if all those guys are together and somewhat healthy, they can do anything here? I, I see them out in the first round. Yeah, Giannis's health is the wild card for sure. Um, you know, all those games happen with Adrian Griffin as the coach, right? Um, I think what's interesting about this round is the the little history of beef we've had this season between the Pacers and the Bucks. There's been a lot of uh, back and forth verbal sparring, both on the court and off the court in media. We had the Giannis game ball. Uh, conspiracy debacle. Uh, <laughs> the the Pacers obviously won the in season tournament semifinal in Vegas, and and Tyrese Halliburton was very very uh, adamant about letting the Bucks know uh, during that game <laughs> that they were going to take an L. Like this this has the potential to be a really fun series uh, in that six three spot in the West, in the East, and and obviously you know it's just dependent upon Giannis's health and and. For the Bucks, obviously, if they're going to make a run here in the East, he needs to be at full strength. So the Eastern Conference, like you said, Boston and then right now, the way it looks on paper and the way it's looked on the court for the majority of the season. We know the West was the total opposite, even coming down to the last day to decide the one seed. And ultimately, Oklahoma City becomes the youngest one seed that we've seen. And JJ, I've heard from plenty of people that cover the sport, like you with backgrounds in the sport, how difficult it is for a young team to make that jump in the postseason because of how different this changes. So what does Oklahoma City have to do to go out here and back up this number one overall seed in the postseason with all of this youth and inexperience. Yeah, I, again, it's it's like becoming a, a parent. You don't know until you know, and then once you know, you're fine. So uh, there, there probably <laughs> is some level of adjustment. I think what's untraditional 
what's untraditional about Oklahoma City getting the number one seed and being this young and having to go play an eight seed is who that eight seed probably is, right? We're talking about uh, a 46, 47 win team potentially in that eight seed. And you're potentially playing against LeBron or Zion or DeMontis Sabonis, De'Aaron Fox, Steph Curry. The Western Conference, there isn't any matchup that you could show me. You know, we're, we're a day away from the play in here. There isn't a matchup you could show me that I'm like, oh, that's an easy out for that team. That's an easy series win. The West is just so stacked and loaded. Oklahoma City, what, uh, two years ago, 24 wins. Last year, 40 wins. This year, 57 wins and the youngest team. It's been incredible. If you had to pick just one of the play-in teams, Pelicans, Lakers, Kings, Warriors, to make a run like potentially the 76ers could make a run, which one of those teams would you bet on? Um, I, I would say, for me, in order, it would go Pels, Lakers, and then take your pick between the Kings and the Warriors. I, I the the Pelicans, when healthy, uh, have all the metrics of a great team. You know, there was a, a I, I didn't look it up this morning, but for most of this season, they've been a top 10 defense, top 10 offense. They have positional versatility. They have lineup versatility. They have a guy who's going to make my first team all NBA uh, defensive team in Herb Jones. He's an absolute wrecking ball. Um, you know, Zion as this like point Zion, a, a, an offense initiator, uh, they, they just have a really well-balanced team, uh, Lakers. I still have a lot of question marks of their, on their defense outside of everyone, except Anthony Davis, who's had a phenomenal defensive season, but this has not been a good defensive team. Uh, but they, they still, you know, w- w- you look at the, the lineup data, once they move Roy Hachimura to the starting lineup. The shooting numbers since mid-January. This is a legitimate basketball team. And Anthony Davis, LeBron James playing at an all-NBA level. uh, We shouldn't discount the Lakers for making a a run here. So, JJ, you said you've got Boston winning the East. Who do you have coming out of the West? Look, I, I think ultimately you have to look at each series, each round, and each matchup. Uh, I, I, I would be willing to like go out on a limb here and say Denver is probably my favorite uh, just because of their experience from last year, how well they have played together. Uh, That starting group uh, benefited from a lot of health this year, Um, massive amount of minutes together. Uh, And then their bench has rounded out. Peyton Watson has done a, a, a nice job buying into his role as a defensive disruptor and a cutter and a fast break leak out guy. Uh, you know, I talked to coach Malone earlier this season about him. This was probably in January or something. He's like, you know, Peyton's always talking about his, his game and his bag. And I've, I've really tried to get him to buy into his role on the team. So you look at the margins for some of these teams, Boston in particular, everybody talked about their bench. Hey, how about Peyton Pritchard? How about Sam Hauser? Two guys that had phenomenal seasons. How about the fact you're bringing in an OG one of the smartest guys, one of the best hubs in basketball on both sides of the floor, and Al Horford. So sometimes we can get caught up in all the narrative talk about the great players. It is often the role players stepping up in big moments that can decide a playoff game and a playoff series. Uh, We heard it from you last year, the Batmans, the Robins, and then the Alfreds that ultimately can be the one that can swing a series (laughs) in the NBA postseason. So uh, great stuff from J.J. Redick, who you mentioned. You're going to hear on the call throughout the postseason with Mike Breen and Doris Burke and Lisa Salters doing a phenomenal job. Also on the old man and the three, everything else in the media empire around JJ. Congratulations. Mind the game has been awesome to launch. I know teaching people more about basketball is something you're very passionate about. Before we let you go, I was curious and wanted to ask you, because you're a guy that knows so much about basketball and has so much to give. You're sitting down and doing a podcast with arguably the greatest player of all time and certainly one of the best basketball thinkers of all time. Has there been anything you've learned in talking to LeBron that you've gotten to ask him about or were curious about along the way with this? Um, I, I would say I'm always learning. (laughs) I'm always learning. I think that's why I do a podcast. I, uh, it's funny. I, I've been asked that before and I, and I say this sincerely, there are very few episodes I've done over 300 and I don't know, 50 podcasts in total between all the different 
stuff I've done. I, I, I learned something new almost all the time. Uh, we, we did a, we have a coaching series on the old man of the three. And I had one of, uh, one of the candidates for coach of the year on, uh, on, on, on Thursday or Friday, and that'll come out next week. And I'm literally writing down pages of notes while he's talking, you know? So for LeBron, you know, it's simple stuff about the way he sees the game. And it, maybe it's, it's simple to, to a basketball fan, but sometimes, uh, there's some profoundness and simpl simplicity. You know, whether that's his reads against a flood defense or how he would guard Golden State splits. You know, the thing from the first episode where he's talking about the peel switch uh, against a baseline out of bounds play. Never really thought about that before. Interesting coverage, right? So, I, look, I, I'm always trying to learn new stuff. And I, it's funny, I, I feel like I know a lot about basketball. The beautiful thing about basketball is that it's constantly evolving and constantly changing. I've seen more stuff this year that I hadn't seen in the past when I watch film or I talk to coaches. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, that's what I love about the sport is that it's not a static thing. It is a very dynamic sport. that's always changing. And there's so many different influences and so many different vantage points of how to do things right. Uh, it's what makes it uh, so beautiful. It's no doubt, and it's fun to see and hear it through your eyes and uh, so many of the great people that are helping cover the game right now as we turn the calendar into the postseason. So, JJ, we appreciate the time this morning, brother. Best of luck on the call and throughout the postseason. We're looking forward to it. All right. Appreciate y'all. Thank you. Thanks, man. See ya. Mike, I'm, I'm wondering, Mike, what – see ya. I, I'm wondering, Mike, did you have a guy, a player, a coach that you watched film with, played with, sat with, that was like, wow, I'm, I'm learning so much more about this game. Cause I, I had two people. Yeah, I, I, I had one when I was a fifth year senior in college, Harry, he was my offensive line coach who I've talked about extensively on the show, who obviously, you know, outside of you is the most important football figure in my entire life. But he brought in guys that used to play with him that would help sit with us. And Olin Krutz, who was the longtime center of the Chicago Bears for a whole bunch of years and was kind of a player I, I, I didn't see myself in because Olin's one of the best to do it. But he was a little bit more of an undersized guy, incredible technician, incredible thinker. And we got to watch film with him, me and another one of the centers on our team, you know, behind closed doors, got to go sit and watch film with him and to just hear the questions that he was asking that at that point we didn't even think about. He's like every play, hey, because you know, for most people uh, talking about this, when you're an offensive lineman, especially in college, like in a lot of these spread, hurry up, no huddle offenses, you don't get like the formation in a way that matters to you. You get your part of the play. What's the protection or what's the run scheme here? And you kind of know, all right, if you're a tackle, do you have a tight end next to you? All that stuff. You know little things, but you don't know the big picture stuff that you hear every time you hear those long plays the quarterbacks barf out. He wanted to know all that. He wanted to know, hey, what formation are we in? Where's the strength? Where's the motion coming from? So I know how the linebackers are going to react here. What's the coverage shell look like? So I know which of these linebackers is most likely to be the guy that's going to come and blitz to us here. The way he saw the game from the center position was so complete and took in so much information to help him do his job better up front that it was one of those big lights on moments for me of oh you can't just worry about what you're doing in a phone booth down here on the offensive line I had a buddy of mine who used to just draw in his spot when we would take our offensive line tests and the rest of us we'd sit there together and we'd all go over it because what does it matter if one of us sees the picture if the rest of us don't and in this case with Owen it was well hey look at how important the rest of the picture is in finding out and giving yourself probability wise a better chance of knowing and seeing what's coming by understanding where the rest of the people on your offense are positioned. It was just such a lights on moment for one, how much more there was to add to my game, but also man at the NFL level, how much information these guys are taking in down in, down out, play in, play out. And I got to, you know, be in locker rooms briefly in camp with guys like Marquise Pouncey, who was certainly one of the best to ever do it. Max Unger, who was with the Saints when I was there, who saw the game at an incredibly high level. Talked to guys like Eric Wood, who were incredible incredibly cerebral players at a position that demands it. So that was one that always stuck out to me. Yeah. I mean, and a lot of this is uh, when you get into game day, it's based on what you see on tape as well. Remember when I was done playing and I would call games, I would call them for a couple of years with Bill Curry. For those that don't know, Bill Curry played in the NFL for a number of years and was a college coach for a number of years. One of the, one of the smartest guys 
I've been around, and we would go to the site for our college game, and we would be going, given the, the coaches tape, and our whole crew would go in there, and usually a half hour in, all the crew would leave because we were like three plays in, in a half hour. Just it's amazing how long you can break down one play to so many different ways. So that I enjoyed that so much. Uh, got to call two of Peyton Manning's games, one in college, one in the NFL. Didn't get to watch film with him, but to sit in a production meeting and ask him football questions and to hear his mind go from recall from years ago to what he sees now was an unbelievable education. And then probably within the play, when we would watch film amongst ourselves in Philadelphia, Seth Joyner, I've talked about this before, Seth Joyner, one of the better players I've, I've played with, more, and very intense as well, but unbelievably smart in watching tape. We would go do it as a defense in breaking things down and listening to you know, what you saw, what you saw here. Because I've, I've played with players who are great athletes that were great all pros on their great athleticism, you know, and didn't care much about the game plan where certainly from a linebacker position, he's got to know a lot more, kind of like the quarterback, you got to know everything. That linebacker, the guy who's calling the plays has to know everything going on. So it is real for people who we think we know the game, and we do know the game. You play it long enough, you know the game. But man, there are just some people that are a little different, right, in what they see. You know, and the fact that you could watch one play for basically 10 or 15 minutes and break it down, you know, 50 different ways, it's such a, such a learning experience. Yeah, I, I think seeing what people pour into it is, is really interesting. And I saw I, 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 Jay King over at The Athletic did a really good article about uh, Christoph Porzingis and how he had evolved his game to get to the point now where he's become this hugely important piece for the Boston Celtics and how much of that happened when he was with the Wizards. And he talked about this guy he employed to help him use the analytics surrounding his game to teach him about what he needed right. to improve on to be more efficient, where he could trim fat in his game. And it was this really great illustration. We talk about analytics all the time in decision making, but a guy and a player using it to say, where are the areas that I can improve that are actually going to be matter, matter? What's useful on the court? And then everything he did to go and replicate those situations in his work, use those to inform what he did and how painstaking that was. And that's for a guy in Kristaps Porzingis that's at best the third player on that team, maybe even the fourth best yeah. player on yeah. that team. And so we think of that always relative to some of the superstars that you might see what goes into their game. But every guy out there, some of the guys named oh, Owen Krutz, who I mentioned, Seth Joyner, who you mentioned, they were never the biggest names on any of these teams that they were on, but they were hugely important, and everything they poured into it made its entire engine go. So fascinating stuff as we get ready for the NBA postseason. Thank you to our friend J.J. Redick for stopping by.
and Golik with the all weekend team. The weekend roundup, the best things you saw this weekend. Gojo, I'll toss it to you first. What do you got? Yes, this is an important one. And uh, we're going to go second team and first team today because as we go through this, every week we do this segment. Every week, my poor father stumbles upon it right before the segment like it's the first time here. And I'm going to buy time and filibuster yep. while he sorts out his thoughts because all weekend team has just become a place for me to get college lacrosse takes off. And friends, they did it again. It really we're is. not doing honorable mention today. I am adding an honorable mention again here as we'll do honorable mention second team and first team for the best weekend performers outside of the normal stuff that we saw because sports are busy and a lot was happening besides the Masters and the NBA playoffs, like the number one ranked Notre Dame men's lacrosse team managing to hold on and get a last second almost buzzer beating win against Cornell on Long Island. An incredible effort by this crew, led in part by, at the end, an incredible defensive play from Notre Dame midfielder Jordan Faison. That name might sound familiar because Faison is also a star on the football team. He was the MVP of the Sun Bowl at his play at wide receiver. He was the one that started off that on partial scholarship and lacrosse and then walked onto the football team, but because of the NCAA rules that say if you play any snaps as a player on the varsity football team, you got to be put on scholarship there so people can't stash guys. Everyone got introduced to Jordan this fall when and really, he was a five-star big-time lacrosse prospect coming to Notre Dame and made his presence felt in a big way on the series that led to the Notre Dame game-winning goal. So shout-out to Faison for making that happen. Shout-out to the Notre Dame lacrosse team for keeping the number one on top of Grace Hall lit and full and illustrious. Man, it's a beautiful thing. Boy, see them go back-to-back -back would absolutely be awesome. They are fun to watch. Uh, my second team, I'm going to go back to the Masters and Neil Shipley. Uh, Central Catholic alum in Pittsburgh and native there. I mean, he was second in the U.S. amateur, that, that amateur. That's why he got in to the Masters. And still that final round. And as I mentioned before, he, he called a friend of his who had been a friend for more than a decade. This kid was like 20 years old to be his caddy. And here they are on the last day playing with Tiger Woods. Bad for Tiger because it certainly didn't go Tiger's way after an 82 uh, on Saturday. So here he is with, with, with Neil Shipley. We talked about this earlier, Mike, how nervous it had to be for Shipley because I'm sure he wanted to talk a lot with Tiger. And you could tell Tiger was not happy and certainly not feeling all that well physically. But once they kind of broke the ice, they started showing some, uh, uh, some clips of them talking to one another and, and in, in a nice conversation. Uh, and I just thought Shipley is never going to forget that moment. I don't know where his career is going to go. We'll see. Young kid. We'll have to wait and see. But that moment for him, I mean, just making the Masters, and then all of a sudden on Sunday you see the pairings, or you knew it after Saturday, you're going to be paired with Tiger Woods. Uh, if you're a golfer, that's obviously someone who you grew up just absolutely admiring. And I love the press conference at the end. When the guy, when, when the reporter asked him, it looked like Tiger wrote something down on a piece of paper and handed it to you. And basically, Shipley was like, nope, no, he didn't. And the guy was like, well, it looked like he did. Nope, never happened. And that was it. That was the end of the press conference. So I don't know what the hell went on there. But cool for Neil Shipley and his caddy to hang out for a round with Tiger, who, who again, once, once kind of the ice broke, seemed to really, really, you know, kind of talk a lot to the kid and, and answer any questions he had. Yeah, it was a cool moment to see on a day that already for Shipley, I mean, was the biggest crowd I'm sure he's ever played in front of. And then 10x that because you're in the group with Tiger already at Augusta, like the pressure just kept mounting. And he ended up actually playing pretty well that day alongside Tiger Woods. Dad, my second team all weekend pick actually fits right in with that because one of the other indelible images of Tiger Woods this weekend was him shaking hands with a tree. And while he wasn't actually shaking hands with the yeah. tree, it looked like he was shaking hands with the tree because coming up on the back nine here, he stopped to say hi and pay his respects to one Vern Lundquist, who was, comp or was uh, excuse me, uh, announcing and broadcasting in his 40th and final Masters as an announcer for CBS there and just so happened to be behind a tree when that was going on. But a lot of people stepping up, Dad, to give Uncle Vern his flowers for everything that he's meant to the coverage of this event. I appreciated the people that went back and pulled our friend Holly Anderson's story 
about Vern Lundquist meeting, I believe it was his third wife, at a drink. He was going to meet a friend out for a drink who was on a blind date and talked about how the guy sitting there on the blind date wanted to set Vern up with one of her friends and the guy leaves to go and take care of his business and pay the check and go to the bathroom. And Vern just looks at her and goes, so how involved are you with this guy? She says, oh, this is our first date and it's a blind date. And so Vern said, well, forget what he's talking about Thursday night. What are you doing Saturday night? To which she replied, I think I'm doing whatever you're doing. Vern Lundquist, Mr. Steal Your Girl, game by the pound out here letting everybody know and use the guy's government name in the article. So top to bottom, a stellar weekend for Vern Lundquist. That, I mean, listen, Vern Lundquist, how many years involved with the Masters? Just really, really something to watch, uh, to watch him do his thing. My, my first team's got to be Caitlin Clark. Right? And her appearance on Saturday Night Live with the Weekend Update guys. I mean, absolutely. I thought she did a great job. You never know how, how people not in the entertainment world, acting world or whatever, are going to come. And this was where um, it was uh, Ryan Gosling was the, I, I believe this is the one where he was the host. Uh, unless yeah, I'm, Ryan I'm Gosling was the up. host and Chris Stapleton uh, was the musical guest. I mean, it was it was a phenomenal show all the way around. But what Caitlin Clark did with those guys uh, on the Weekend Update, you know, where why do I keep Michael Michael his last name? Michael I keep che. pronouncing it wrong. Uh, Michael Che. Yeah, it's not hard. C H E. It shouldn't be that hard to, pr- to pronounce. But Michael Che, where where they brought back clips of him disparaging women's sports and women's basketball, and then Caitlin Clark ends up next to him. Uh, and just starts ripping him and does rips off some jokes of her own. I thought she handled herself really well. I thought she did it really well uh, as well. So uh, kudos to her for jumping into, as we're seeing these college athletes jump more and more into com- as NIL, jumping into commercials, getting in front of the camera for commercials more and for products, and good for them. And then going on, obviously, on shows like this, I thought it was fantastic what she did. I thought she did a great job. As, and about to be the number one pick in tonight's draft. Stars. I was just going to say, we'll talk about the WNBA draft here coming up, but she's one of the biggest yep. stars in the world of sports. She's a household name that everybody knows now. And so her being on Saturday Night Live felt right. And Michael Che, and for people that have missed it on SNL, on their weekend update sketch, had done a bunch of jokes at the expense of women's basketball that they all brought up on a highlight reel to play with Caitlin Clark there before she kind of played in to the bit where him and Colin Yost write jokes for each other. It was awesome. It was well played. It was a great, great payoff to a season-long bit for them. And just a continued reminder of the star power of this player and the current place of the women's game. She took time in the midst of all the conversation around her and elevating the women's game, did take time to name drop a bunch of the legends of the women's game that she said, I am standing on the shoulders of. These are people that have built what I'm a part of. And so as that had been a conversation, I thought it was interesting and purposeful that she took the biggest stage that she had to make sure that she was giving love to people who all along the way others felt like hadn't been giving the credit that they deserved. Deserved. Dad, let's stick with Hollywood and go for my first team all weekend. Wrexham SC. Ryan Reynolds and Rob McElhaney went over and introduced everybody to Wrexham FC and welcome to Wrexham, the TV series that's now following a team that's getting promoted again. They won 6 nothing over the weekend to ensure promotion for the second straight season. They now move up to League One. For people that aren't familiar, English soccer has multiple tiers inside this, and they are now in what is the third highest tier of English soccer. You think of the Premier League, that's the highest level of all this. The top 20 teams below that is the championship level with 24 teams, and then League One, which is where Wrexham is now going to be. So, Dad, two straight years, two straight shots moving on up and what started as a fun story about two American movie stars that people loved and people I'm sure over there not being sure what to take from this in terms of sincerity have now seen it reflected in on-field success yeah I mean listen it's a great story but and and I don't know enough about the team or about the leagues to know how far up they can go I don't know what their their supposed ceiling is if they've already certainly surprised people jumping up the way they did. Obviously, you'd love to continue to see the story grow. You know, it's like a Hollywood scripted story, but I I truly have no idea how high they can go. But you know what? Enjoy the ride while it's happening. I was going to say, from 2021 till now, it's already surpassed, I think, most people's expectations. So why not keep this thing going?
draft kicks off tonight, 7.30 in New York City. Let's take a look at the draft order because it actually recently changed, and that matters when we talk about Angel Reese in a second. Seven now is Chicago, eight is Minnesota, so that flipped. Minnesota was at seven, which is important because if we take a look at the odds of the DraftKings Sportsbook, Angel Reese... Number set at seven and a half. The under juice to minus 300. Originally, guys, that was minus 150, so that saw a ton of action. At first, we thought that meant she was going to Minnesota. Maybe now that means Chicago. But I, I want to talk about this because if we're talking value, I see a little bit of value with the plus money. There's been suggestions she could go 10 to the Connecticut Sun. A bunch of names flopping around here. And the issue with this market is it's really all smoke and mirrors like any other draft gojo. So curious how you would sort of look at this from what you've heard. What direction do you think Angel Reese will go? Some other names up here. We can talk about Cameron Brink. We can't really talk about Caitlin Clark because we know that she's going to go number one. But what do you think about Angel Reese and the movement on her number? Well, I, I think it's interesting just in general that we're talking about her in this range because, Dad, coming off the last couple of seasons, she's been one of the stars of the sport. She's been on, had her name on the banner alongside Caitlin Clark and a bunch of others because she's been at the helm of this LSU team that was a national champion a year ago and then back in that same range this past season had the rematch with Caitlin Clark. And so we've had a lot of this conversation that it's been really interesting around Caitlin as the tipping off point for, hey, that jump to the WNBA level and how different everything is and you're playing against grown women and the game is you know the best 144 it's one of the most exclusive clubs in pro sports based on the small number of people that actually make it onto a roster but ironically at Angel Reese who was again a star player in a national championship outfit now going to this next level where especially as someone that's going to be a forward that's going to be a little bit more with the bigs how difficult people look at that transition for her amongst others like Cameron Brink and Camila Cardoso who just right. more because of the size and ability there might be better fits for the next level. Let me ask you this then, Senior. I'm going to make you answer one way or another because we do have to do our cash or trash it segment presented by yep. DraftKings. Stay tuned for everything DraftKings has to offer throughout the show. DraftKings, the crown is yours. Gambling problems? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Age and eligibility restrictions apply. Void where prohibited. See DraftKings.com for details. All right, we got Gojo's take. So, Senior... Cash it or trash it, Angel Reese off the board in the first seven picks. I, I think I'm going to trash that. I think she's going to go after that. You look at the first eight picks now that that trade happened. Minnesota sitting at eight now. L.A. has two picks in the first eight. Chicago has two picks in the first eight. If they traded up to number seven. Uh, what you mentioned, Mike, uh, I, I love her. Uh, rebounding and a defense, but she's going to play amongst some bigger, some bigger bigs now. And the question about her game that she had to improve was offensively, seven to twenty-one in their loss uh, to Iowa, and that's been something that people know that she would have to work on from the offensive side. So that's why I, I do think it'll be it'll be eight or higher, probably probably eight to Minnesota. So. I'm going to trash that one. It's, listen, it's a great night for everybody. It's the first time, I believe, they're having fans at the draft as well. So just another first for the, for the women's side of this and the WNBA and the draft. So an exciting night for all the women involved. And you mentioned it, Mike. Listen, we talk so much about Angel Reese because she was a headliner. She was one of the stars. But as we know, when you get into this part of it, it's not about how big of a star you were, though you know that could sell tickets. There has to be the basketball involved as you're breaking down players on what they're going to bring to your team. Um, so I, I'm, that's why I'm going to trash this. I, I hope the best for everybody, you know, with, without question. And I, I can't sit here and say I know a ton about all the women that are going in this draft, certainly know about more than a few of them. Um, but just, just from where she's going to have to play now in the WNBA and the, and the offensive side of it, I'll trash that. I'll cash this. I'll say the young woman who's a walking double-double in college is going to continue to help that out here. I think sometimes, Dad, we talk about this with the draft, too. Team need can take precedent. Best versus most available is always yes. – or uh, best available versus team need is always the debate we have in these drafts. And I think part of this just might be how the draft board shakes out. I'll say she, wa she winds up in Chicago. They need a bunch of help at a bunch of different spots, and I think she could certainly provide that. She has been one of the steadiest players in the sport for the last couple of seasons in the mid 
midst of all the personality and all the marketability and the things that we noticed there, I think there's plenty of game. I will say she gets picked at seven and goes under on that as well. So that'll be an exciting night. Again, I'm sure going to be great coverage from the same crew that we saw during the women's basketball March Madness run there with Cheney uh, and L. Duncan, Andrea Carter and company who are going to do a phenomenal job with that that we're all looking forward to. I think the other bit of big news over the weekend, Dad, and we talked about this relative to where we grew up out in Scottsdale, where you are right now, is all those rumors and all that smoke we heard about, that turned into fire very quickly, Claudia, as the Phoenix Coyotes uh, getting ready to take the Phoenix right out of that and apparently head to Salt Lake. The Oats are headed to Salt Lake City, baby. I don't really know what the weather's like out there, but it's not Arizona. Uh, GM Bill Armstrong did go <laughs> to the players ahead of the game against the Oilers to say, yes, the rumors are true. They are selling to Ryan and Ashley Smith, the owners of the Utah Jazz. The Yotes will be playing there next season, and the plans for them to play at the Delta Center, home to the NBA Jazz. They did say, though, we're going to have to make some changes to make this more hockey-specific when it comes to upgrades. The official announcement expected later this week. So I'm sorry, Senior. I know you didn't want to see this happen, but it's happening. Yeah. This is a shame. You know, this is a team that was – they moved from Winnipeg, Winnipeg Jets. They moved there in 96. I got here – in 95, after I retired and I was calling games for ESPN, I was doing morning radio here. So me and, and my wife, Chris, and Mike, I think, was five or six at the time. Jake was four. Sydney was just born. We all came out to Phoenix uh, to do when I was doing radio. But we would go to these games. They were new to the Valley. It was a ball, the whiteouts in the, in the playoffs. I mean, we had so much fun going to the games. And then they kind of been nomadic, whether it's a practice facility or where they were going to play, playing on college campuses. It's been very difficult for them. Um, then they drew up a couple of plans in one of the cities here in Mesa that got rejected. Then they were getting ready to draw up a plan 10 minutes from my house here in Scottsdale about a whole area, obviously a shopping area and a, and a rink and give them a permanent home there because they really hadn't had one. So we were looking forward to that. And then you get this coming about that the play, that, uh, uh, the GM had to tell the players before they played Edmonton the other day that they're moving. So uh, anybody locked down and living here, get ready to move the whole kit and caboodle out there to Utah and see where it goes. So, you know, it's a shame, but they, they, were, they were all over the place, Mike. I mean, they, they really didn't have a home. They weren't, it, was just a, it was just a bad relationship after a while here on, on what they wanted, what they were getting. So overall, it doesn't surprise me uh, way the situation had been for the last number of years that they're out of here. Yeah, it sucks because the fans and the players are the ones that end up losing out on this. I saw Sarah Sivian reporting that a lot of the players and prospects were a little bit disheartened about the way that this has been handled and how their futures were sort of being very de dealt with very in a very cavalier way. And so now they all get to take yeah. that plunge. The fans in Arizona lose out on this because the league looks at the stability of Ryan Smith and that ownership group that also own the Jazz and say, all right, at least we can have something going here. And it's a shame because for the time being now, they're letting uh, Alex Morello, the owner of the now you know, former Phoenix Coyotes, keep the naming yep. rights to the Coyotes there because they said eventually they want a team back in Arizona down the road, and so that means we're going to lose the Coyotes as a name, and we're going to lose one of the greatest logos in sports. Like I know the Carolina Hurricanes do this where they bring back the Whalers logo every once in a while, and it pisses Connecticut people off something fierce. But I really hope we don't have to see the old school Coyote die because as someone who grew up with a poster on their wall of Keith Kachuk, Jeremy Roenick, and Nikolai Hobby Bulin alongside that famed logo, it's an incredible, incredible visual and was a ton of fun for that team. So uh, I'm bummed out here. We'll see what it becomes in Salt Lake, though. It's, it's interesting because in June, in a couple of months here, uh, there's a state-run land auction, which, again, is like 10 minutes yeah. from my house that Morello had said that they were going to bid on and they planned on outbidding everybody else to get that piece of land to build this facility. Now, uh, we'll, we'll see. And, and from what we heard is it was going to be fought as well by some of the residents. I, I don't know why. I, I get so bummed at that because I love seeing these things put up. But, but now uh, it'll be interesting what ends up going there. But I, I, they are going to keep the name and, and I guess, like you said, hope just like the Whalers that they get a team back. Yeah, it was like Happy Gilmore trying to buy back his grandma's house at auction and instead Shooter McGavern yeah. bought it, burned it to the <laughs> ground, and pissed on the ashes.
Facebook Live. All right, welcome back. Time to finish off the show the way we always do. This, that, and the third. Three quick stories to send you in the rest of your day. As always, make sure you download, subscribe, rate, review us, leave us a five-star rating, and check us out live Monday through Friday here whenever you can on the DraftKings Network from 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern or noon to 1 p.m. Eastern wherever you hear VEASAN on the radio for the best of Gojo and Golik. And if you miss us or any of our great guests here like J.J. Reddick, the host of the Old Man and the Three podcast, ESPN broadcaster, you can get that wherever you get your podcasts or right here on YouTube as soon as we get done. And before we get to this, that, and the third, we've got Claudia Bellafato, our intrepid reporter, down here on the scene as Marathon Monday's finish line right outside of the DraftKings office. So, Claudia, what's the mood like out here as we get ready for one of the biggest days in Boston? Reporting live from... <laughs> it's actually a lot calmer out here than I thought it would be, but I guess that's just because there's no runners yet. But I'm expecting that, what is it, 30,000 runners and I think 50,000 plus people coming to watch. So soon this is going to be filled with folks but just a lot of big buses and people preparing for the runners um and i might run a mile today so we're sort of on the same path here there we any, go i say you gotta help everyone any, finish strong at the end of all this dad <laughs> the last sprint any any thought any thought on either one of you ever running a marathon in your lives yes yeah, three is my limit like absolute max, I'm gassed. I'm done. Can't do it. Wait, yeah, three I marathons am. or three miles? Three miles. Three miles, senior. <laughs> three miles. <laughs> Unless there's three, like a million dollars there. waiting for me at the end, then I could train for a marathon. But that's pretty much it. So none of us are running a marathon anytime soon. But as we get to this. All of us love chicken. We just finished our Starch Madness bracket. We had a lot of conversations about fast food items here. And we always see these in arena things come up in NBA games where there's a promotion going on. If a certain player from an opposing team misses consecutive free throws, a lot of times they'll give away the goods. And we had this last night, the Houston Rockets playing the Los Angeles Clippers in the fourth quarter. Boban Marjanovic, beloved gigantic figure in the NBA space, goes to the free throw line in the fourth quarter. The Rockets were up and already winning and Clippers fans inside the arena would get a free Chick-fil-A sandwich if a visiting player missed two free throws and Boban had preparation meet opportunity. Watch this man deliver for the people. Fans are getting excited here. There might potentially be some free chicken on the board if he misses his second free throw. Oh man, free chicken on the board. Yeah, so that's why the fans are getting a little, little frothy. Oh, they're pointing to you. And Boban's playing with the crowd saying you want chicken? Here's your job. Oh, he gave him chicken. He's a man of the people. He's a man of the people. He did that on purpose. He did. He gave him free chicken. <laughs> but for anyone that couldn't see the visual, Boban is literally at the free throw line. He missed the first one, and he's looking at the crowd going, I got you. I calm down. I got you. So, Dad, while we can debate Boban's free throw percentage up if that second one was going in to begin with, where are you at on professional basketball player in the final game of the season throwing the free throw to get free chicken to the crowd? Because I love the move for a guy that's already been one of the most likable oh. players in recent NBA history. I love the move, and he absolutely obviously missed that last free throw on purpose to get people the chicken. Listen, there was the, the, the game that, that wasn't close, nothing riding on it at that point. So in that situation, I think it's awesome. I think it's absolutely awesome that he did that. I think it was, the, the way he was playing it off, too, to the crowd, looking up into the crowd, like you said, I got you, I got you, and then on purpose missing that free throw, that was fantastic. They have to make a commercial out of this because that goldfish commercial with him is my favorite of all time yes. when he's grabbing it with his massive hands. Like, I hope it's Chick-fil-A, right? I hope Chick-fil-A sees this and jumps yes. at the opportunity. <laughs> Boban has already been one of the most marketable athletes on the planet. He got to be in a John Wick movie. We need this guy in more places because he understands exactly what the moments need. We always talk about this with athletes, and Boban did it in the biggest way possible, delivering chicken. Hopefully more athletes take a note out of his book and understand that, yeah, points in the box score go some way towards your legacy, but it's the mark you leave on people, and it's a lot easier to leave a mark when you're armed with chicken sandwiches. Dad, speaking of people that left a mark, let's get to that. Andrew Luck, former Indianapolis Colts quarterback, attended the 12th annual Chuck Strong event Friday night in Indianapolis, supporting his former head coach, Chuck Pagano. And as part of the annual fundraiser, which helps raise money for cancer research, they had Andrew and Chuck up on stage, and uh, Colts owner Jim Ursay 
said that he would match. He would donate a million dollars to the cause if they were able to clear all of these faces. Think like the carnival game where you got to knock it down with the baseball in under a minute's time. And dad, incredibly traumatic for Indianapolis Colts fans because watching him cut it loose, Andrew Luck still got the juice. You could see it up there. He was yeah, lethal. That, I don't know if Chuck Pagano yeah. hit a single one of those targets. So how did this make you feel watching one of the former best players on earth back at it? I think it was very cool. First, Ursay saying a million bucks. Now, I, I, maybe he'd have given it anyway, but 60 seconds, there were 16 faces they had to knock out. And the way they were standing, it was kind of like eight on each side. Well, Luck knocked out his eight, and he actually grabbed Pagano by the shoulders and put him over to his side where there were no more so he would have a better angle at the other ones so they could knock them all out. It was awesome. But, yeah, he was rifling the ball, and they got him. They got them all. They got the million bucks. It was a very, very cool moment and a very cool way to raise a lot of money for a great cause. That was fun to see. Claudia, it was a reminder of what we lost. Andrew Luck, I think, is one of the most fascinating case studies of modern NFL players who would right now, Dad, be kind of the bridge quarterback from the Brady and Peyton Manning-led era to this point now with Patrick Mahomes and company. He would have been the elder statesman in the league for all of this on a Colts team that had gotten better every year he was there. you know, Seth Wickersham did the profile a while back on Andrew Luck post-retirement in his life, but one of the most fascinating players of my lifetime and a guy who... Still looks like he could probably go out there and throw better than about 16 quarterbacks in the NFL. Yeah. All right. Very likable, too, to if we're talking likable athletes. <laughs> That is true. Incredibly likable, goofy voice, Jack Doyle, all the things that we miss about our friend Andrew Luck and Colonel Andrew Luck from the SB Nation days as well. But finishing off with the third, we might as well get to, again, where Claudia is right now. It is Marathon Monday in Boston. There are an estimated 30,000 runners here, an estimated 50, 500,000 spectators in line to cheer on the marathon, which is always a big day. And Claudia, I feel like marathons in general are such a fun party for a lot of people around it, the celebration of friends or other people running for charity, running for personal reasons, what have you, that make these marathon events such a big deal. But in Boston especially, and you can tell us this as someone who's been out there certainly for quite some time, it does seem like this city's relationship, some of that tied to tragedy as well, but is so mm -hmm. special and so unique with this particular race. It is, yeah. I mean, it's heartwarming. Everybody's talking about it. A ton of people have school and work off today. I'm happy we don't because we get to do the show and get to come out here and actually see it all. Um, the funny part of this, though, is a lot of my friends are running it. And I heard that once your friends start running marathons, that means you're officially getting old. And I'm only 27, but it's true. All of my friends are either engaged, pregnant, or running a marathon now. And what am I doing, guys? I'm just working. <laughs> not a bad not, thing, though, right? Yeah, not running a marathon. <laughs> no, not, I'm good. I, I, listen, I'll eat the pasta so wait, the, and I'll drink the beer after, so, but I'll just watch. <laughs> there you go. The beers after hit different, too, when you're dehydrated post-marathon. What I've heard, because I'm not a marathon runner, to Claudia's point about age, there are 35 marathon runners that are age 65 or older that have finished the Boston Marathon, and the oldest person to ever finish the Boston Marathon has been a tie amongst several people at 85 years old. So, Dad, forget us. Has any part of you now that you're light and putting much less weight on your bones no. ever thought about this? <laughs> No, not a chance. I have to get my left knee replaced at some point, and this would just speed up the process if I tried to run 26 miles on it. So that's not happening. Five Ks as far as I go. Your mother's the one who ran. She ran the New York City Marathon years ago. And wow. to me, it was, to her, it's the training these people do for the marathon. The amount of miles you run to train for a marathon, let alone then run the marathon. She crossed the finish line. It was great. Gave her a hug. She went to the person she was raising money for, and she said, I enjoyed it. Thanks. If you want me to ever run it again, I'm just going to write you a check. I ain't running it anymore. One and done. But she did it. And I will and ne I'd never do it. my mom's claim to fame is that she beat Alicia Keys. Alicia Keys might have the voices. Yes, she, she might have awards and accolades. My mom dusted Alicia Keys in the New York Marathon, and you can never take that away from her. Boom. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Happy Marathon Monday.